Hello everybody, welcome back to an episode of Decoding the Unknown. My name is Simon, I'm your host here on this channel. I'm here, one of my writers, in this case Dave, thank you Dave, has written me a script, Flight 19, never read it before, I'm going to read it, we're going to go through it together, dear viewer, or dear listener, if you're on the podcast, if you're on the podcast, have you thought about leaving a review? It's, uh, it's very kind. If you've thought of doing one altruistic thing in your life, this would be it. And then, basically, the doors of heaven, gates of heaven, the gates of heaven open to you, St. Peter's like. <laughs> I saw you leave that review for Decoding the Unknown. Come on in, my son or daughter. Welcome. Uh, let's just crack on, shall we? That was, that was pointless. I'm already making the introduction way too long. Let's go. <laughs> Almost everybody can tell you at least one story about an airplane that disappeared in mid-flight. Unsurprised. Have you guys seen that show? What's that show where, uh... There's a... Is it called Manifest? Where there's a plane and it disappears and then it lands in the future. And I'm like, that is a brilliant concept. Wow! Wow! That by that show I just thought was just not very well executed. No offense to that show. It just... It's a show that is like... It felt like, you know when you watch, your, does anyone remember in the 90s and you watch the sci-fi channel and there'd be like TV shows that just didn't look like they spent a ton of money on? And I mean, nowadays, any show from the 90s looks like that. But like back in, it was particularly bad back in the day. And I feel like this show was the modern equivalent of that. I'm not sure what network it was on or how much it cost to make, but it felt a bit budget. And I'm like, I wish this was done by like whoever did AB, um, ABC. <laughs> Breaking Bad. Was Breaking Bad by ABC? Or like, just put a load of money into it because it could have been really awesome. That is true. Anyway, God, we're two lines in and two minutes in. This is gonna take a moment, isn't it? Unsurprisingly, these disappearances are often linked with wild stories of alternate reality gateways, alien abduction, or top secret government plots. However, although these make for thrilling stories and busy Reddit threads, the reality is honestly almost always just pretty mundane because it's like our oh, plane disappeared did it <laughs> got some bad news that plane ain't coming back it's just not because they can't fly forever they have to land somewhere and a plane landing somewhere tends to get you know some attention and if there's been a plane crash like out at sea like in lost i'll tell you what they don't all survive like in lost they all die because it's a horrible plane crash in the middle of the ocean there's no magical island they're all just dead i'm sorry even though none of these disappearances have been scientifically linked to any out-of-this-world phenomenon, it does not mean that the stories behind them are not interesting. This certainly is the case with today's story, that of Flight 19, perhaps the most interesting and unusual of the aeroplane disappearance stories. What's up with the word aeroplane? Is it airplane or aeroplane? Hmm. Like, I would always say airplane. We're gonna get on the airplane. But should I be saying aeroplane? Have I just been doing that wrong? Aeroplane. That just sounds weird. It sounds like I'm in the past. Like, oh yes, darling, get the trunks. <laughs> We're going to get on the aeroplane. Yes, jolly good. As to be expected, it contains all of the usual conspiracy theories. I just muted this iPad. Why am I continuing to get Discord notification sounds? Why, Apple? Why? Notifications. And there's a Discord. The, I think Liam. Was it Liam? I think Liam set it up. He's one of the writers. And it's very busy with all the writers and other people and such. And it keeps notifying me. And I have to say that right now I'm turning that off. I'm sorry, everybody. Because I've got work to do. <laughs> Unlike you guys, apparently. Whilst we'll cover the ideas behind all of these... All of what? Oh, okay, like the crazy conspiracy theories about planes disappearing. We shall also endeavour to come up with the most likely explanation as to what happened on that fateful day. Tell you what, tell you what, I'm gonna guess already. Get a guess ready. Plane crashed. So, dust off your tinfoil hat, select your beverage of choice. I'll be having coffee. Instant coffee. I run out of capsules from my machine. And I have backup instant coffee. And it's fine. It's fine. I actually have the capsules at home, I just keep forgetting to take them to work because I'm stupid. Yum. <laughs> so, dust off your tinfoil hat, select your beverage of choice, sit back and relax as we take a deep dive into exactly what might have happened to Flight 19. What was Flight 19? Well, let us start with Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor. I'm going with Lieutenant because Lieutenant is how we say it in the UK. I used to get. Did I tell the story? I used to get in trouble for this. I watched so much Star Trek as a kid that I'd always refer to anyone called Lieutenant as Lieutenant. And I was in the cadets, in the naval cadets. 
And so I'd always buy, like, be like, yes, Lieutenant. And they'd be like, Lieutenant, boy! And I'd be like, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> You're too much Star Trek. I'm sorry. And it's clearly spelt Lieutenant. <laughs> But I always do it. If they're British, I'll use Lieutenant. If they're American or international, I'll use U Lieutenant. What do Canadians do? What do Australians do? What was your... Lieutenant? I feel like you'll be Lieutenant, right? Taylor, who would go on to lead the training mission known as Flight 19, was by no means a rookie. Having racked up over 2,500 hours of flight time, 600 of which were in the TBM, Avenger Torpedo Bombers, the same plane used for Flight 19, as well as having two years experience as a flight instructor, he should have been more than qualified to lead what has been described as an exceptionally simple training exercise. The It's on mute, but I keep getting notifications. Stop. And I can't turn it off in case I get a phone call. Oh, Christ. Why do we live like this? Turning off my internet, that'll solve the problem. <laughs> the exercise, known as navigation problem number one, took place on the 5th of December 1945. According to the D National Archives at Fort Worth, quote, navigation problem number one required Taylor to fly eastward from Fort Lauderdale, contact, conduct a practice bombing run at Hen and Chicken Shoals, just north of Bimini, continue eastward, then turn north, fly over Grand Bahama Islands, and then turn southwest and return to base. The flight would cover approximately 316 miles and last two hours and 40 minutes, end quote. At 2.10 p.m., Taylor and 13 other naval personnel took off in five Avenger torpedo bombers. According to the records, the first leg of the exercise was completed without a hitch. However, at 3.40 p.m., it became apparent that the mission was not proceeding as it should. A transcription from the radio broadcasts between the aircraft show that one pilot radioed to another to obtain a compass bearing, and the response came back saying, I don't know where we are. We have got lost after that last turn. Is this the one where they're like talking about something like whitewater, whitewater? Is this this one? I feel like I know vaguely familiar with this slight conspiracy theory. After this, the afternoon only got more strange. At approximately 3.43 p.m., Lieutenant Taylor put out a radio call to a pilot on the ground saying, Both my compasses are out, and I am trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I am over land, but it is broken. I am sure I am in the Keys, but I don't know how far down, and I don't know how to get back to Fort Lauderdale. At the time Taylor sent this message, he was completely lost. Although he believed himself to be southwest of Fort Lauderdale, he was, in fact, northeast of his intended destination. Had Taylor followed the standard operating procedure for being lost in the Atlantic and simply headed towards the sunset, he would have most likely found land and be able to reorientate himself. Yeah, this is something that any aviator's gonna know. It's like, oh, okay, the sun's over there, bada bing, bada boom, I know where that is, doesn't matter that my compass is broken. Like, you're gonna go where the sun is because you have training in maps. Like, I've taken a few flying lessons. It's quite basic. I mean, the flying's complicated, but like, everyone knows the sun sets in the west, guys. Um, I get the feeling, my gut feeling about this is it's um, lack of oxygen, right? You know, at altitude that makes you go a bit loopy. There's that amazing video. Is it the guy from Veratis... Ver Ver Veratia? Oh, God damn it, what's that channel called? Uh, Ver Veritasium. Veritasium. Boom. I've never said that out loud. <laughs> Is it him who goes into that chamber where they simulate being at high altitude without the um, without oxygen? So they're like, yeah, this is what it's like at 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet or whatever. And they're like, okay, so take off the oxygen mask. And he takes off the oxygen mask and he's doing fine. And then they're like, okay, can you put the, can you put the cube in the square thing? And it's like the sort of thing my one-year-old could do. And the dude's like, oh, uh, it's just not working. He's just really trying. And he's like, he's happy. He's like, I just don't know what's going on. And then they're like, okay, we need you to put the mask back on or you're like, you know, you're going to die. And he's like, hey, what mask? I don't know. I don't know how to put a mask on. And he's just sitting there like an idiot. And you're like, oh my god. No, brain needs that oxygen. It's crazy. So I reckon he's going a bit loopy or something, right? Because he's just like, not, not right. He should know how to figure this out. Unfortunately, he now believed that he and his planes were somewhere over the Gulf of Mexico, and so decided to fly northeast and attempt to locate the Florida Peninsula. In actual fact, he was now flying further out to sea. By this point, several of the other pilots had begun to lose faith in their leader. <laughs> Where's he going? <laughs> What's his name? Taylor, what's his first name? I want to use his first name. <laughs> Charles. Where's Charlie going? What's he up to? Charlie, come back! Do you think he had a cool, cool sign? Charles Meister. The Charleston. I like that. That would be... If I, if I, my name was Charles, I'd be the Charleston. Charleston. 
Records of the conversation between the pilots indicate that one man said over the radio, Damn it, if we would just fly west, we would get home. It appears that Taylor was eventually persuaded to fly west, but shortly after 6 p.m., he reversed his decision and ordered everybody to fly east again. By this point, it is believed that at least one of the pilots had had enough of this and headed off on his own. <laughs> like, fuck this for a bunch of soldiers. I'm going home. Fuck you, Charlie. <laughs> You need more oxygen in your brain, Charles. Unfortunately for both the pilot and the other two men on board and the records for this sto for the story, the plane fared no better than the others. Uh-oh. One of the problems with being lost in the sky with nowhere to land is that aircraft require fuel, and should that fuel run out, your options quickly become exceptionally limited. This scenario was quickly playing out for everybody involved in Flight 19. As the planes flew further and further out to sea, their radio transmissions became more and more faint. Taylor was heard prepping his men, men for a crash landing. All planes close up tight, he said. We'll have to ditch in less landfall. When the plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. A few minutes later, the Avengers' last broadcasts were replaced by nothing. Nothing apart from the persistent buzz of radio static. The Surge as you'll probably be unsurprised to hear, the Navy was not prepared to simply let this go, and a huge search was immediately launched. I'd feel a bit bad if the, the Navy was just like, oh yeah, who was it? Oh, it's Lieutenant Charlie. I'm glad that f is lost, to be honest. <laughs> no, they'll be like, let's go find them. We're the Navy, that's what we do. Let's get some ships out there, let's get some planes. Let's go find our boys, no man left behind. A huge surge was immediately launched. Part of that surge included the launch of two PBM Mariner flying boats, the fate of one of which adds more fuel to the fire of conspiracy theorists who claim that something is amiss with the official report. At 7.50pm, 20 minutes after it was launched, one of the flying boats also completely vanished, along with 13 crew members. Oh my. Over the next five days, the Navy launched more than 300 boats and planes, which would search an area of more than 300,000 square miles. Neither Flight 19 nor the missing flying boat were ever discovered. So. Where did they go? Up until this point, my version of events has been largely taken from official reports, so I think it only makes sense to carry on in that vein and look at the official explanation before we start looking at some of the, shall we say, slightly more outlandish explanations. First of all, because it is the most simple disappearance to explain, we shall look at the flying boat that vanished during the search. The official Navy report suggests that this plane suffered some sort of fuel leak and exploded. This is certainly not without precedent. PBM Mariner flying boats were nicknamed the flying gas tanks because of their propensity to leak gas fumes, and it certainly certainly wasn't the first time that one of these planes exploded. The likelihood of this scenario is further backed up by a radio message broadcast from the tanker SS Gaines Mills. While passing through the same area in which the flying boat disappeared, the captain noticed a sudden burst of flame which went on for about 10 minutes. The transcript of the message he sent reads, at 19.50, observed a burst of planes, apparently an explosion, leaping flames 100 feet high and burning for 10 minutes. Good lord. Position 28 degrees 59 minutes north, 80 degrees 25 minutes west. A present passing through a big pool of oil. Stopped. Circled area using searchlights looking for survivors. None found. End quote. The USS Solomons, which had been tracking both flying boats on radar, also reported that this was the exact point at which one of them disappeared. Now, on the face of it, this seems fairly open and closed. The notoriously unreliable aircraft suffers from a known fault and bursts into flames. We shall have to see if any of the alternative versions of the story provide a better explanation. But what about the flight for which this video is named? What about Flight 19? What did the Navy claim happened to those planes and the people on board? As with any such incident, a thorough investigation was carried out, although what happened was never definitively proved. The Board of Inquiry concluded the leader of the flight became so helplessly confused as to have suffered something akin to mental aberration. Okay, so I wasn't like far off. He's just like lost it. He's got a bit loopy. And I mean, that the thing you'd think about first has got to be lack of oxygen or carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Further reports seem to have attributed this confusion to a number of factors. Firstly, Taylor did not actually have a clock in his plane, so he was unable to know how long the squadron had been flying in any given direction. Information that is incredibly important, especially when you're flying over open water without the aid of GPS. Um. He doesn't have a clock in his plane? What are you up to? He's not wearing a watch? <laughs> what? They're like, yeah, we're just going to go up in the sky, fly around for a little bit, come back. How long? I don't know. <laughs> Until we're done. <laughs> what? Secondly, as he reported in one of his radio messages, both of his compasses seemed to be malfunctioning. Thirdly, although an experienced pilot, he was new to the area and had very little experience with flying over the Bahamas. I believe it's also worth mentioning that, although I could not find any substantial evidence to back them up, I found several reports which claimed that on the morning of the incident, Taylor had been excused from duty, saying something along the lines of, I don't want to take this one out. 
At least two of these reports claim that, due to a turbulent romantic life, he had also been drinking heavily the night before and may not have been fit for duty. <laughs> what? A naval aviator? Never. As for what happened to the planes and the men on board, a report on history.navy.mil says, quote, The most likely explanation is that the aircraft ditched as a group off the co east coast of Florida, north of the Bahamas, in the face of a rapidly moving severe weather front. The prospects of survival in an Avenger ditched at sea are marginal at best, especially for the air crewmen in the back. Ditching an Avenger at night in heavy seas would almost certainly prove fatal, causing the plane to break up, and if anyone got out, they would not last long in the cool December water and winds. So, there it is, the official version of exactly what happened to the unfortunate individuals who took part in Flight 19. Thank you so much for watching and listening to today's... No, obviously we get into the conspiracies. <laughs> this is a perfectly reasonable explanation from the government. They're like, yeah, the guy, something went wrong with the guy. He got a bit lost and he crashed in the sea. Boom, done, easy. Weather was bad as well. That's right, I said it! From here, things get a little bit more unlikely. The Bermuda Triangle. Now, if you're watching this video, I can probably quite safely assume that you have watched similar videos, and as such, you probably don't need an explanation as to what the Bermuda Triangle is. Well, I'll tell you what, tell you what, the Bermuda Triangle's not real. There's no more planes and boats going down in the Bermuda Triangle than anywhere else in the sea. However, as my grandfather used to say, assumption is the mother of all fuck up. so here's a brief description taken from a short I wrote about it. Ah, yes, we also do shorts, like YouTube shorts. Your welcome world. <laughs> the Bermuda Triangle, a section of ocean between Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico, has for a long time been the subject of many alleged disappearances. It is claimed that more than 50 ships and 20 aircraft have mysteriously vanished without a trace in this area over the years. Given that Flight 19 would appear to have gone down inside the triangle, many people have attributed the disappearance to one of the many peculiar phenomena that are alleged to take place in this area. When I was a kid, I always thought there was a big sea monster there. Is that actually one of the theories? In my mind, it was like, there's the Bermuda Triangle. And you know when you're a kid, you just believe anything. You're like, yeah, sure, of course. The Bermuda Triangle, everyone knows that real. And in my mind, there was like a giant sea octopus coming out of the water and like reaching up and grabbing planes and taking them down into the sea. Maybe this was from like some cartoon or something, but that's always what I remembered, always what I thought of when I thought of the Bermuda Triangle, like a giant sea monster destroying planes. <laughs> like reach, what, reaching up like 30,000 feet into the sky being like, yoink. <laughs> oh, children, they crazy thoughts. One of the more frequently suggested of these phenomena is the existence of wormholes. Okay, we're going straight there, are we, Dave? Not even sea monsters. Like, sea monsters reaching up 30,000 feet into the sky to snatch a plane from the heavens is more believable than, like, f***ing wormholes <laughs> in Bermuda. These wormholes, or rips in the space-time continuum, allow aircraft or ship to instantly travel hundreds of miles almost instantaneously. Many people have claimed and continue to claim that somewhere out there in the Bermuda Triangle are various wormholes. Oh, there's more than one of them. <laughs> it, it's littered with wormholes, which we don't even know really exist. These wormholes, or rips in the space time continuum, allow ships or aircraft to instantly travel hundreds of miles instantaneously. Those proponents of this particular theory often cite Taylor's second radio message. Quote, I am over land, but it is broken. I am sure I am in the Keys. End quote. Surely, the wormhole people claim. The only way he could have gone that far off course is if he travelled through a wormhole. Yeah, that's the voice. How do you get off course, uh, wormhole? Why are you doing just not pay attention? Look, this dude forgot to take a watch. <laughs> Is that he just got lost? <laughs> now, geography really isn't my thing, and understanding maps even less so. However, the likelihood that Taylor was, in fact, flying over the Florida Keys as he believed is incredibly low. As I previously mentioned, Taylor was new to the Bahamas. Before being based there, he had been based in the Florida Keys, and according to several people who have taken the time to study aerial photographs of both areas, the group of islands that Taylor and the rest of the squadron were flying over, located north of the Bahamas, look incredibly similar to the Florida Keys. If you add in the mix that Taylor was undoubtedly panicking, then this is certainly a forgivable mistake to make. A mistake that, more importantly, requires no wormhole activity whatsoever. Yeah, we can immediately just say it's not the wormholes. He's just looking at some land being like, oh, it looks like Florida. I guess it is Florida. <laughs> it's nice, the Bahamas. 
Because Flight 19 has officially never been located, several books that have been written on the topic have proposed another Bermuda Triangle-related theory. The specifics of these theories vary slightly, but they all center around another radio message that Taylor sent during the incident. In this message, Taylor allegedly claims that everything looks completely wrong, they cannot see any land, and the sea appears to be a strange color. Bro is not- he's got that carbon monoxide problems! People who are determined to believe that something supernatural or otherworldly took place that day have said that this radio message is evidence that while traveling through the Bermuda Triangle, Flight 19 was unfortunate enough to travel through some sort of portal into an alternative dimension or another world. Yeah, there's another thing that like altitude and uh, not altitude, um, lack of oxygen can do. It can make your vision turn funny because your eyes aren't getting enough or your brain or whatever is not getting enough oxygen to work properly. So you have these different like there's red out and white out and black out and all of these different things of light that can just affect you in different ways. While I'm quite happy to admit that the radio message was unusual, the real question is whether or not Taylor sent it. According to a documentary that originally aired on the BBC in 1976, no such message was ever broadcast. The makers of this documentary spoke to both the officers who were in the radio tower at the time, and both of them categorically stated that they heard no such message. I wonder where it came from. He's always, it's always going to be like, some dude's writing a book. <laughs> he's like, I just want to sell more copies of the book. So he's like, yeah, what about the mysterious message? What mysterious message? The one I made up up <laughs> let's shift some units baby as pretty much all the Bermuda Triangle theories rely heavily on this the fact that it never likely happened is fairly damning yes it is government cover-up so if flight 19 wasn't teleported to an alternative dimension what else beside the official report says could have possibly happened why can't we just accept the official report <laughs> why it's like the government's covering up its wormholes. It's like it just crashed. <laughs> because we, as humans, often struggle to believe anything the branches of the government tell us, several private investigations have been carried out in an attempt to discover where Flight 19 went. I, yeah, don't get me wrong. I don't particularly trust the government or anything. <laughs> but it's like, why would they lie about this? Like, there's plenty of shit I'm sure they lie about, like, fairly on the regular. But most stuff is really boring and no one cares and there's no reason to lie. Like, the reality of most things is they're boring and it's just boring. And that's what's going on here. It's just boring. I'm sorry. When compared to the outlandish Bermuda Triangle themes claims, these investigators have actually yielded some fairly interesting results. Is it going to be interesting though? Well, let's see. During 1963, a lawyer from Florida named Graham Steichleather was hunting in the Florida swamps when he came across something quite unusual. That something was a downed aircraft with navy markings. Inside the plane were two bodies. Holy <laughs> How? How? Really? He quickly informed the authorities and the wreckage was removed. According to Strikeleather, a member of Navy personnel said that it was highly likely the wreckage was something to do with the Flight 19 incident. Curious to find out more, he made several attempts to discover the identity of the two bodies found in the plane, but was repeatedly rebuffed. I don't think that's realistic, is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, thanks for finding this plane. It's probably got something to do with Flight 19. Why would they say that? They'd just be like, thank you, sir. Have a good day. And then they'd just turn away. <laughs> like, the military's not in the business of, like, just revealing random bits of information to civilians. It's not what they do. They're trained not to do that. They're just like, they shut up, the person comes, they take the plane away, and that's that. It's the military. It's not like, talk about all the sh** you've done. That you just shut the f*** up. It's the military. Apparently, having grown weary of being refused information by the Navy, Strike that the contact of a friend of his who worked at the Pentagon. This friend allegedly told him they would get no further information, and he should immediately drop the case. No, again, like, someone at the Pentagon's not like, that is in movies only. It's like, I think you should drop this. That's only gonna make the person more interested. You'd just make something up, you'd be like, oh no, it's related to like a trading exercise in like 1982, and the guy's name was this, and the guy's name was that. Do you want anything else? And he'd be like, no, nah, it's really boring. Thanks, though, mate. That's it. You're not like, don't speak about this ever again. <laughs> That's just insane. That only happens in the movies. Instead of doing that, he would later join forces with another investigator, Tom Ma, who believed that instead of crashing far out to sea as the Navy claimed, several of the planes may have turned back and actually crashed somewhere in the Florida swamps. Given that Strike Leather appears to have found the correct model of plane with Navy markings, 
This theory is not entirely without merit. Although the squadron was under the command of the Navy, it included several Marine pilots, and it is these pilots that Maher believes may have broken away from the main group and taken their chances on their own. In 2013, Maher filed a Freedom of Information request in one final attempt to find out who had been on board the downed aircraft. Unfortunately, this request was denied on the grounds that the names of the recovered bodies had been redacted from the Navy's records. Ma believes that the aircraft was one flown by Marine Captain Edward Powers, Sergeant Hal Thompson, the gunner, and Sergeant George Pownessa, the radio man. Now you're probably thinking there are only two bodies found in the aircraft, one to the third. Ma believes that the radio man, George Panessa, somehow survived the crash and for reasons unknown decided to go into hiding for the rest of his life. <laughs> It's getting a bit now it's getting a bit far-fetched i mean it was a bit far-fetched because we know they're not in the florida keys and i say travel through some sort of magical wormhole it's just another plane that the navy crashed because it's the navy they're probably crashing planes like fairly regularly obviously this idea appears to be completely insane however there is one piece of evidence that lends a little credence to this theory okay let's see while researching the archives of the naval air station fort lauderdale museum ma discovered a copy of a telegram sent from the naval air station in jacksonville just a couple of days after Flight 19 disappeared. This telegram, which was addressed to the family of Panessa, reads, I am very much alive. Signed, Georgie. While it is most likely that this is, at best, a misguided attempt by an unknown individual to provide false hope to the family, and at worst, somebody's idea of an amusing prank, the family, for understandable reasons, believes it to be genuine. When interviewed, an employee at the museum, yeah, but they're super biased, aren't they? They're, of course they want to read it. And why do you say this is, at best, a misguided attempt to provide false hope, or it's a prank? I'll be like, at best, it's a prank, and at worst, it's someone's, a, someone's trying to f with someone who's it's just lost, a family's just lost their, like, family family member. When interviewed, an employee of the museum, Minerva Bloom, told a reporter, The telegram is believed to be a hoax by many, but I am not 100% sure because the family believes it's authentic. As only close family members knew his nickname, Georgie. Well, his name's George. They only, only like close family members knew he was called Georgie. Really? Hmm. The one problem with the cover-up theory is that nobody seems to be able to provide even a slightly plausible explanation as to why. I mean, I fell down a Reddit rabbit hole which provided an amazingly detailed theory about how the entirety of Flight 19 had been abducted by aliens, a theory which included many more alleged broadcasts from Taylor, the last of which said, I know where I am now, don't try and come after me. According to this theory, the United States Navy were not only aware of the alien involvement, but had actually arranged for planes and pilots to be taken away in some sort of technology swap. Yes, 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 yes. The aliens that have traveled to our planet are very interested in our amazing technology. The aliens that have traveled light years through space, fascinated by our, by our iPhones. Greetings. Jesus, <laughs> come on. Because, you know, an alien species was capable of traveling to Earth, successfully abducting five airplanes and their crew, and transporting them all back to their home planet, so they'd obviously be interested in our technology. Exactly, Dave. But apart from that highly likely sequence of events, unless I'm missing something incredibly obvious, there doesn't appear to be any logical reason why the Navy would want to disappear a large amount of valuable equipment and personnel. Again, I'm open to suggestions. Maybe Simon could think of a reason, or maybe somebody can post one in the comment section. I'm sure people will, but I'm just like, it. the plane's crashed! The guy got a bit loopy for whatever reason, crashed his planes. Boom! Done! So let's do a quick recap. Do we think that the disappearance of Flight 19 was an unfortunate and tragic accident caused mainly by pilot error? Or do we think that mysterious forces at work in the Bermuda Triangle transported the planes way off course and caused them to vanish into an alternate dimension? Incidentally, and I did not know this until carrying out research for this script, although it might appear that an unusual number of boats and aircraft have gone missing within the Triangle, given the fact that it is a particularly high traffic area, a plane crashing or a boat sinking is no more statistically likely there than anywhere else. I told you! Additionally, given that the Triangle covers some 500,000 square miles, it is not all that surprising that things have been lost there that are difficult to find. If you don't believe me, then perhaps you will believe the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who state on their website, There is no evidence that mysterious disappearances occur with any greater frequency in the Bermuda Triangle than in any other large, well-traveled area of the ocean, as boaters and flyers continue to venture through the Triangle without event. 
Lastly, we have the option of a military or government cover-up. While I accept that the Navy's reluctance to provide any information on the downed aircraft and its occupants might be taken by some people as evidence that they're trying to hide something, military organizations are notoriously secretive. Furthermore, we don't actually have any evidence apart from hearsay that the downed aircraft was anything to do with Flight 19. In fact, I never actually found any indisputable evidence that the plane ever existed at all. As for the story of the alleged survivor who sent a telegram to his family, if you believe that you survived some sort of military plot to get rid of you, would you really send a telegram to your family from a naval airbase? I suppose he could have been in shock after surviving a plane crash, but it seems a little bit risky to me. For the record, boring as it may seem, I'm inclined to believe the official version. However, as always, I'll leave it up to you, Simon, to make up your own mind on the matter. Dave, come on, mate, you know what I was going to say. It's the, If it's not the official ber- version, it is something as boring as the official ber- version. Because any video that contains the Bermuda Triangle always results in a plethora of interesting theories, I look forward to reading the comment section on this one. Yes, short episode today. Thank you so much for being here. If you liked it, smash that like button if you're listening to it. Like I say, leave a review. It's the best thing you can do. And I'll see you next time.